Hey, everybody, and welcome to PDA's Town Hall for the day before tax day 2024. We've been doing this for four years now, having our Sunday town halls. They started during the COVID pandemic, and we continued them on. Uh, they initially were all about the COVID pandemic, and now they are on so much more. And today we have a really, really important town hall. First off, because we have back with us uh, for the first time since she was an initial candidate, Delia Ramirez. Uh, and Delia Ramirez is a freshman member of the U.S. House of Representatives, and she is a squad member. She's the ninth squad member, as 7th, 8th, and ninth were elected in the last cycle, um, along with Summer Lee and Greg Kassar down in Austin, Texas. And... Um, you know, I, I just don't know what to say other than, and I'll say this again later, I was on a call with her this week. And every single time I see Delia these days, I'm ever more impressed. And um, fortunately, uh, Delia Ramirez won her primary in Illinois in a heavily Democratic district, and so therefore is pretty much guaranteed to return to the House of representatives and we need to get all nine members of the squad elected there and we'll be talking with her about that but we'll also be asking her about her experiences in congress and a little bit more about her own personal background which she spoke about on the call i was on with her this week i was so impressed again the the level of commitment and also you know when she talks about her experiences in congress i think it's very telling we have such an incredibly sharp divide within our political class in America right now. Um, and she really spoke to that brilliantly on that call as well. So we're very excited about that. And again, our um, electoral priority right now uh, at this hour in the primary season, of course, is to elect as many progressive Democrats to have them win their primaries as possible. But um, we knew going into this political cycle without with an incumbent Democrat, it was likely there wasn't going to be a progressive champion on the presidential stage as there was in the last two electoral cycles. Of course, in, in large part, thanks to the initiative of this organization, Progressive Democrats of America. Um, I was, of course, not the executive director at the time, um, but Tim Carpenter was. And uh, through Tim's initiative and the team at PDA, of course, we drafted Bernie Sanders to run for president as a Democrat and changed American political history. But fast forward, really about not 10 years since the time, well, a little bit more than that, since we launched the Run Bernie Run campaign. And for the first time since that time, we don't have a progressive champion in the primaries. And those two back-to-back -back Sanders campaigns did so much to elevate uh, the progressive movement, uh, especially within electoral politics in the United States. So how, how do we persevere and grow the movement um, at this moment? And again, on the call that I was on with Delia Ramirez this past week, that was one of the subjects that was addressed, and uh, no one was more eloquent on that call than our guest today. Uh, I want everybody to stick with us the entire town hall, if possible. Obviously, what transpired yesterday was surreal, and it also, to a degree, again, maybe not surprisingly, shifted the ground geopolitically. Um, we are signed on to an effort with our partners at Peace Action and a number of our familiar partners across the progressive movement uh, to support a grassroots effort to call for a ceasefire in Gaza and a permanent ceasefire. And um, so we'll be addressing that with the president of Peace Action, Kevin Martin, in the second hour. And we'll also be joined by Mimi Kennedy, one of the founding members of PDA, the great... Um, actress, comic actress, political thinker, and leader of Progressive Democrats of America will be joining us along with and after Kevin to talk about a really brilliant idea she floated um, this week, which is the idea of, because of the pragmatics of Congress and the desire to end the siege of Gaza as soon as we humanly possibly can, the pragmatic proposal so that we can get enough votes in Congress to get this to pass. The idea of saying, okay, the U.S. 
Congress and the majority in Congress wants to remain committed to supporting uh, Israel as an ally. But increasingly, people are appalled at what's transcribing, what was what's, what's, what's happening in the present, transpiring in the present, to put any military commitment to Israel to hold off on it and to put those funds in something equivalent to an escrow account. And, you know, we in PDA, Mimi came up with this idea. We sort of spent some time troubleshooting it uh, for a few days, and we agreed it's something that was worth floating publicly. And so we're doing that later in the town hall. So there's a lot here, a lot of ideas that we'll be putting forward. But I just want to do this before I throw, as always, to Mike Fox with our PDA to-dos and then to hear from Donna Smith, um, who is, of course, the chair of our advisory board and the host of our brilliant podcast, Positively Progressive. I really want to alert everybody to this ceasefire campaign. And, you know, we were clearly building momentum, building momentum, building momentum. We'll see where we are as things settle in the wake of what happened yesterday um, in terms of that momentum. But we are going to be sending in what we call a liaison letter. Everybody on the call, I'm hoping everyone here will commit to sending the letter I'm putting a link to. Sorry, in the doc. Actually, Danette, can you put the link into the into the the correct link into the chat? Just did. Um, I'll do it again. No, thank you. You rock. Um, there we go. That docs link. Here's the letter. If people can pull it down, copy and paste it into another form because this is an open link Google Doc. Please don't edit on the document. Okay. I mean, we have a copy of it, so we can preserve it. Tomorrow evening, we're going to have a national liaison call. Okay, that's the link that is at the top of Danette's post. The bottom is the liaison letter in its current form. Okay, and uh, we are going to be sending it en masse as PDA members to your member of Congress. Okay, and and I want right now to, to have a commitment as much as we can from every single person on the call, this, this call to commit to sending this letter in. The world needs a ceasefire in Gaza. The horror there has to end. Nothing about what happened yesterday changes that. The lives that are under threat in Gaza are ever more with each passing day an ever worse situation around hunger. There is simply no humane rationale under the sun for allowing this to go forward. And of course, it going forward is contingent upon U.S. military support, and we have to set up a mechanism to make sure that our country and we as part of the polity of this nation demand a ceasefire now and a permanent ceasefire. Humanitarian aid into Gaza and uh, support from Israel's military to be conditional upon the ending of the siege of Gaza. So... Um, what event am I referring to yesterday? I'm referring to the drone strikes on Israel from Iran. So, um, which clearly, in terms of people's perspective on the geopolitical realities of the conflict in Israel and Palestine, you, people are going to take that as to change things. I don't believe it changes anything in terms of the siege of Gaza. Um, we can debate that off this call and maybe in a little bit in the second hour. Okay, so... Um, there's a letter. Please get it, copy and paste it into whatever form you like. And then on Tuesday, on mass, PDA is going to send it out to your representatives and senators. Um, there are just there's only one sentence that can change one way or another, in case you're off the call later when we discuss it further, because some people have supported the ceasefire. So there is something thanking them for that and asking to meet so that you can get in dialogue about the best way forward. But for the people who haven't, which remain the vast majority of Congress members in both houses, it is uh, asking to discuss why it is that they don't support a permanent ceasefire yet. Okay, so that's there right now. Other than this, Mike Fox, our PDA to do is over to Donna, then over to Delia Ramirez. Mike, let's take it away. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Excellent. All right, gang, as always, number one to do on this call each and every week at four o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Pacific is revel in the fact that you're surrounded by people who get it. We're living in some troubling times right now, and a lot of us can get down through that process. So please do take a moment to reflect upon the fact that right now you're surrounded by folks who see that there are challenges, but together we are going to work to make the world a better place. One of my primary um, goals for this call is for everyone to feel better when they leave this call, okay? So let's work to make that happen. Number two, take notes. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of very good stuff here that we're going to want to act upon uh, over the upcoming hour. So please do uh, take notes and uh, make sure that we pile on with those actions. All right. Now, from a time and treasure standpoint, time. Number one thing that we need folks piling on with is phone banking, phone banking, phone banking, phone banking. We're in the game in a big way for squad member Summer Lee right now. Uh, APAC money, dark money, et cetera, et cetera, abounds in that race. And so we have to have her back. Uh, a lot of folks on this call were probably on our big um, uh, event with her last Saturday. Huge success. Only positive energy. Phone bankers who are on this call right now. There's a lot of them. Type into the chat uh, for the um, type into the chat. Excuse me. I got distracted by a, by, by a chat. Uh, type into the chat that uh, you are um, a phone banker and that you want somebody's help. OK, we're trying to get at least 10 new people from this call on the phone bank with us for just an hour. That's all we're looking for. Uh, that's pdamerica.org slash volunteer. Pile on. We'll make sure that you're doing something productive. Secondly, from a time standpoint, Danette's going to be continuously tossing into the chat the um Sign up link for tomorrow's liaison call. Pile on, pile on, pile on. It'll be quick and uh, it will definitely be a productive use of your time. Uh, likewise, Matt is always tossing into the chat the YouTube stream. Click it and like it, click it and like it, click it and like it. We need at least 100 likes out of this call. Uh, and uh, lastly, from a uh, treasure standpoint. We have a goal of $2,000 raised today. Uh, if somebody can toss in 100 or more, first 100 or more, I will match. Uh, and if you can only do $2, beautiful thing. It, it's not about how much you give. It's about everybody giving in solidarity with each other, okay? We'll be back at the top of the hour to identify how we're doing on those goals. And until then, back to you, Alan. Mike, I have a really quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has deleted the letter, so I think that we need to revisit how we're doing this. Okay, Alan? we'll do that at the top. That's really annoying that someone has deleted the letter. Please add the letter back into the link, Danette, and um, I'll email it to you while Donna is giving us uh, her thoughts for the week. I'll email it to you as a Microsoft Word document. I would Thanks, like to suggest sir. that we set it so that it is file only and not edit so that folks can copy it over to their own uh, platform and then edit it there. Yeah, view only apparently is what Lynn suggested, and that sounds view best. View only, it's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good idea. Hi, Donna uh, Smith, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing okay. How are you, Alan? It's been a quite a quite a 48 hours, hasn't it? Yes, it um, is. Uh, it's hard to imagine how many times in my life I've been afraid to look at the morning news and wonder what's going on in the world. This is certainly one of those times. Um, I agree with Alan. It should not change anything about calling for a ceasefire with Gaza. Um, the, <clears throat> the drones and the cruise missiles. And I just don't, I don't ever understand war. I, I got to say that. I never understand what war solves um, for anybody. And that has been a lifetime thing for me. From the time I was a, a little one, I didn't understand war. And nobody ever could explain it to me uh, in a way that made me want to accept that uh, people killing other people and normally people who are not in the powerful classes are the ones being killed by other people not in the powerful classes. And it is always very troubling to me. Um, along with other news in the world. However, 
um, whenever I'm on these calls, it does help. It does help to know that there are other people pushing. Uh, I hope, uh, like Alan does, that every single one of you will be in touch with your representatives and your senators, um, regardless of whether they answer you right away. Um, they need to know in force that people are demanding that this stop in Gaza and that it's a horror what's going on. And I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. On the on the podcast side, I'm positively progressive. <laughs> Our last episode had Jenna Griswold. I'm recording tomorrow night a great interview. I, I know it'll be great because I love this woman. Her name is Keisha Rahm Hinsdale. She is a senator a state senator in the great state of Vermont, Bernie's state. I met her some time ago at a Netroots Nation uh, gathering when she and I and Paul Song, Dr. Song from California, were on a panel together. And Keisha was not yet uh, elected into office. And what I want to share with you from that experience is not only has PDA made, had made inroads from many years ago with bigger races, certainly like the Run Bernie Run campaign that we were all a part of, but also in, in so many races around the country where we met these young, committed progressives who wanted to be a part of this conversation, who eventually, because of the mentoring and because of the energy and because of the passion of progressives from PDA, went on to run successfully for races in their states like Keisha. Keisha was in the state legislature in the state house. Now she's in the state Senate. She's only 37 years old. Uh, she's a young mother of one expecting her second, and yet she is fabulous. So I hope you'll all tune in when we get that episode ready to go. We'll also include some conversation with some younger progressives who are teaching us still. So thank you, Alan. I'm having a little trouble with my voice today. So I'm going to throw it back to you. I can't wait to hear the rest of the show. I can't wait to hear my friend, Mimi Kennedy, who is dear to me as any person on this earth. And back to you, Ann. Yes, and uh, we're joined now, I believe I phoned from by Delia Ramirez, who is the you a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from the 3rd District in Illinois. And uh, so uh, Delia Ramirez is, of course, a member of the squad and is really one of the up and coming, in my opinion, uh, progressive superstars in the country. Delia Ramirez, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's crazy that with so many years um, of remote, we're still having trouble sometimes with technology and Zoom. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you um, on, you know, with, with picture and Zoom. So I, I had to call in, but I didn't want to miss opportunity to jump on today. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. And, you know, I was I was on that call with you a few days ago around, uh, uh, you know, the unified effort of a bunch of uh, progressive organizations to support the squad and raise money. And I was so, so impressed with what you spoke about. Um, you know, at any time, of course, if you want to provide your reflections on, you know, what happened geopolitically yesterday with the drone strikes please do. Um, and maybe that's a place to start. And I, you know, we, we all are so in, in, I'm really following the leadership of the squad in terms of our directions inside, uh, you know, the house and in our, uh, congressional advocacy through our 501c4. Yeah. Um, what, what I'm sure you've been in touch with the, your fellow squad members, other members of, of the house yeah. since this happened. What, what are your thoughts on that right now? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. And, and want, first, I also just want to thank Progressive Democrats of America for your support and for the ways that you continue to show up uh, for people like me so that we can represent our communities in the House of Congress. I'm incredibly grateful. Look, I, I think I heard someone just say a few moments ago, you know, you, you sometimes almost feel afraid of opening up your phone or checking your news. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you, don't, you hope that you don't wake up on a Sunday morning to things like today. Um, my heart is heavy, and, and of course, a number of us, we have our, our little squad thread and, and, and woke up to, to see uh, what's happened, and it's devastating. And I think one of us said it, it feels like we're living this nightmare uh, where all of us have said for the last six months, we need to de-escalate these situations because we see and we've seen this possibility of a regional war. And without de-escalating the situation, without a permanent ceasefire, 
we're going to see ourselves dragged into a region of war where instead of bringing peace, long-lasting peace to the region, we are doing the exact opposite. So for me, to be honest, Alan, what we saw happen with Iran yesterday, mm-hmm. to me feels like it is more so a call than ever right. to call for a permanent ceasefire. Look, I, I like the other squad members, we wholeheartedly condemn um, what mm-hmm. Iran did yesterday, but we also condemn the fact that Israel's military attacked the Iranian embassy in Syria. I mean, right. it, it almost feels like there's this intentional um, way of moving to drag the U.S. into a regional war. And, and I've said this, and I've said this to leadership, the U.S. cannot continue to turn a blind eye to what Netanyahu is doing. These dangerous provocations and violations of international humanitarian law should be denounced. And I'm afraid that I'm heading back to D.C. tomorrow. Right. Um, to a House that is prepared to pass a Senate bill that will send billions of dollars to Israel, and we know what it's going to do. It's only going to continue to kill more and more children and drag us into a war, a war that we will look back to and ask ourselves, how could we have done this? Shame on us. So I'm devastated and I'm, I'm concerned. And, you know, some of us, we, we keep raising the red flag. We keep raising the alarm. And it feels like we move one step forward and it feels like three steps back. Well, I want to let you know, um, because while we can't see you and it's a blessing to have you here as you are. So thank you so much for joining us. And this is perfectly fine. Everybody is hanging on every, every word you say. Um, if it is possible to raise your volume a little bit, that would be great. We can hear you but it's a little lower than some of the other voices coming through. But I want to say that you should you should know that we fully align with what you just said. And in fact, in our letter that we'll be sending to Congress members on Tuesday, asking for a permanent ceasefire and asking them to support it, um, we make clear that we see nothing having changed in making that call from what happened. Right. Now, I want to ask you one follow-up question, though. How much consciousness did you sense there was, especially among your Democratic, your non-squad Democratic peers, and maybe outside of the, the group that signed on to the initial ceasefire, or the ones who have signed on to the, the pledge to support a ceasefire, I think it's up to about 82 members that the Working Families Party has on their site. How much yeah. consciousness was there that in a land invasion of Rafa is insane to not yeah. demand it never happen. Was there growing momentum for that? Did you sense among maybe even beyond your democratic peers, just in general in the house? And yeah. if so, are you, I, I, I'm guessing from what you just said, you're worried that that kind of sensibility will be less so now following yesterday. So your reflections yeah. on that. Thanks. Well, well, that's a, that's a great question. Are you able to hear me better now? Yes. Yes. A little better. That's great. Okay, Thank good. You. Great. Good. Great. I took off my, my ear punts. So look, I walked out of Congress on Friday afternoon really feeling a sense uh, that more than ever, members of Congress, regardless if they are progressive caucus or new Dems or even others, are beginning to say out loud what so many of us have said. And, and certainly the idea of invading Rafa, I've heard more and more of my colleagues say absolutely no, we have to draw a line. And I think you saw that and 40 of us sent a letter uh, to leadership and to the president, right. including Nancy Pelosi, right. saying no more unconditional aid and transfer, no, no more transfer of weapons without conditions to Netanyahu. I mean, that was major. To have someone like her sign on just really tells you that the amount of organizing, the work, the phone calls you're making, I know at times it feels like it doesn't, your member of Congress may not be responding, you may not get an email, you may not get a call back, but I promise you people are hearing it. What happened to the aid workers of World Central Kitchen was absolutely devastating and sent goosebumps up people's backs when they saw that happen. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I was watching, I was listening to the Daily podcast, and, and the main um, podcast 
anchor asked a question to the person reporting, do you think that the world would have responded, or even Netanyahu would have almost apologized as quickly as he did, had it not been World Central Kitchen, had it not been a celebrity chef, had it not been the Jose Andres said that what they did was unforgivable. And the truth is, if we're being completely honest, no. If it would have been the many aid workers that have died already right. in Gaza, in Rafa, it wouldn't have been the same outcry. But it was seven people from World Central Kitchen. Right. And it was absolutely heartbreaking to see, but I think it opened up eyes to colleagues of mine who have tried to find ways, right, to still stand in solidarity with an administration that is literally killing children, aid workers, journalists, and even in this case, Canadian Americans. Right. So I, I have to say to you that I have seen the tide begin to turn and more members of Congress calling quietly and some even publicly for there to be a change of course, putting a lot of pressure on the president. But I am also extremely concerned, really worried that what we saw happen now, right, with Iran is going to just help those that have been trying to find something in a way to double down after what happened with World Central Kitchen, use this as, as an excuse that $14 billion has to get to Israel, our ally, as soon as possible. And, and that, that is level of concern for me because many of the folks that I've heard say it's time for a ceasefire are also now saying, I'm ready to vote oh, to boy. send more aid to Israel. And, and, and that is where we have to remind ourselves, especially in this moment, we have to call for a permanent ceasefire everywhere. That is the only way you're going to get peace in that region. Otherwise, we have to prepare ourselves for a regional war that the U.S. will be dragged into and the U.S. has helped create. Thank you for those words, and I agree entirely. Um, I, I suppose I do want to segue now. I don't think we'll get that far away from Gaza because I'm going to ask you about the courage of the squad members in a moment. But um, on the call the other day, um, uh, you spoke in two ways that I thought were just so compelling. And I'd love for the PDA uh, people on the call here to be able to uh, hear you talk about both your mother, your own family's personal history, and how that relates to your political career. And then your experiences in the Congress, you spoke about the contrast between what it's like to be in a GOP-controlled house and the, the negative animus that you experience from the right wingers in the house, probably sometimes yeah. from moderate Democrats too. We can only have to rewind a while ago, but then how brilliant it is to have alongside with you there, the members of the squad. Mm -hmm. So take any of that, whatever direction you like. Um, I found your conversation about your family, one of the most inspirational things I'd heard in, in quite a while in American politics. Alan, thank you for that. I mean, I think for, for those of you that don't know, uh, I am the only member of Congress in the mixed status family. My husband is a dreamer. We've been married almost four years, and we just went to our first appointment, or finally our first appointment for adjustment status. And I'm, I didn't share that in the call, but I think it's important to also share that um, because my husband has been in this country since the age of 14, crossed, undocumented, right, as many young people do, trying to figure out a way to help their family survive. He's from Guatemala same town for my family, my, my family's from. And, you know, I think about that, that interview with that officer that we went to two weeks ago, March 28th, an interview that my husband had been waiting for for 24 years, and where he thought, I will finally walk out of the Department of Immigration, Homeland Security, with an adjustment, and I will no longer be in the shadows. And I went as his wife, not as a member of Congress, but I happened to also be a vice ranking member of Homeland Security. And what I saw happen in that interview was a clear indication of the deep level of dysfunction and brokenness of our immigration system. Right. If it had not been that we had our attorney with us. That officer who has 
half part of it was he wasn't even well trained in asking questions. Would have had my husband answer yes to a question that was really no based on the gotcha way that they asked the question. Mm. And we walked out of there with a decision of a continuance. Sir, we have to still do further investigation to determine if you have evidence to be uh, evidence, which really what we were saying that you are worthy, if you are worthy for an adjustment of status. We have to do further review because we have to determine if when you cross that border, weighing 100 pounds at the age of 14, and perhaps we're scared when we detained you and you gave another name, if that is enough for us to say, no, you don't get an adjustment. I, I share this very personal experience with you mm-hmm. because I carry being the daughter of immigrants, being the daughter of a woman who crossed the border pregnant with me. In that same border I visited back in April a year ago, this time as vice ranking member of Congress when I went to Bronzeville, Texas. But I also, I'm in this place as a wife of a man who is a dreamer who has a DACA status that we know that the courts at any time can change. And if a member of Congress is going through this experience, can you imagine what people in this country, young people who are not that young anymore, are experiencing every single day with 36 years of broken immigration system and being a dreamer with no pathway to citizenship? For me, that compels me in everything that I do to take this work very deeply personal. Because I've been to the border of the, the southern border, right? Not just when my mother crossed, um, but as a vice ranking member, I saw women detained that are pregnant who ran to the glass window and looked into my eyes and whispered, help me. And I couldn't help me as a member of Congress to look into that woman's eyes and see my mother, my 19-year-old mother. Because the reality is that we are still in the same place we have been for over 30 years. And this is exactly why we need members of Congress who have the political courage to show moral clarity and political will to change these systems. And having firsthand experience, I think, gives me the authority, certainly the capacity and competence to be able to push to be able to get to a solution because people are tired of excuses. When it comes to immigration specifically, what I hear people say, what I hear my husband say, (laughs) frankly, Republicans and Democrats could keep promising us when you elect us, we'll we'll finally have immigration reform and people are sick and tired of waiting. And what I'm finding in this precise moment is that Democrats are beginning to sound like Republicans. In the right. rhetoric. Mm-hmm. And, and we can't, we can't use this moment to try to, you know, to try to show that, you know, we, we understand people's experience and fear of the border by sounding exactly like the Republicans are using their rhetoric to create fear of people seeking asylum. And, and I think that we as Democrats have an ability in this precise moment to work mm-hmm. together And do so in a way that we respect the rights of asylum seekers, that we do what President Biden said when he was campaigning, that we work to keep families together, that, yes, we make our borders safer for our communities, but also for asylum seekers, and that we see this opportunity, for example, to expand work permits as a way to not just help people who are being exploited in this country be able to work jobs, um, get living wage jobs, but to also improve our economy and our GDP. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, Alan, I just came from Panama mm-hmm. a week and a half ago. I was the Darien, the Darien gap that you hear about, that the Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Chip Roy all talk about. I saw women coming out of these canoes in the jungle, having lost absolutely everything, having experienced the worst nightmare that you could imagine over 14, 16, 18, 20 days of journey and coming to a realization that as they they got to the Panama side, they were only halfway to their final destination. Right. 
And what I realized was that this idea of our southern border, the questions about immigration, we have a global humanitarian crisis, and it's going to take a global, coordinated, regional approach to address the issues of forced migration. Um, Delia, I think you have actually achieved something on this call that I've almost never seen before. You have every single person who is on here right now, at least on the Zoom room, not watching on the social media platforms, riveted. And I think it's because you are speaking such sense with such heart in such sense about a subject that, uh, you know, we all need guidance and leadership on and haven't maybe heard the kind of clarity of leadership that you're providing. And, you know, I would like to see that the Democratic Party campaign on some, you know, really solid promises about addressing all the issues you just raised. Now, that may not be in the cards for this cycle, but I think, I think there will be an appetite among the activist progressive base in this country if the Democratic Party, which I think is not an impossibility as of this hour, achieves the Senate, control of the Senate, the House, and the presidency, that right out of the gate, we demand what you're calling for as a unified progressive base. I would love to yeah. see that. And I should also let you know that we look like Progressive Democrats of America will be organizing at least one of, if not the major sort of progressive conferences during the DNC week. And we would love for you to join us at that. Obviously in Chicago, it's either going to be housed at Rainbow Push or at um, um, at uh, um, the Chicago Teachers Union. And we'd love to have you speak on this and provide Absolutely. the kind of clarity you just did. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, you know, obviously we have a situation where the Democratic Party is, is, is running and seems to be holding fast, which unfortunately in previous iterations they haven't held to, a commitment to, you know, a filibuster carve out in the Senate, if necessary, to codify Roe v. Wade and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Yeah. They really need to get on page here around the Dreamers. And um, yeah. I'd love to see that. And, and I think up. we can. Right. Look, I, I'm going to be working over the next week to try to add more sponsors to the Promise and Dream Act bill. It's, you know, it's one of those full circle moments. Mm -hmm. my, my parents were factory workers. My mother has third grade education, right? In a thousand years, she would never imagine that the daughter that she would give birth eventually here in Chicago would be a member of Congress. I would never have imagined that that daughter of hers would be the co-lead to the Promise and Dream Act bill. That I would be in a position to be able to. Sylvia Garcia is the main sponsor of the bill and I'm her co-lead. I'm the only freshman co-lead on the bill. And and this next week, our job, um, our marching orders is to get every single Democrat to co-sponsor the bill. So if your okay. member of Congress is not already co-sponsoring it, there's at least 35 Democrats that are not co-sponsors. Please give them a call. Because you hear us talk a lot about discharge petitions. I would like to see a discharge petition on the Promise and Dream Act. And I promise you that there are enough Republicans that could sign that discharge petition, getting us enough signatures to get a vote on the House floor. There are, uh, I think, four Republicans who have co-sponsored the bill already, four or five, actually. Huh. You know, when you talk to them, what they'll say is, well, you know, close the borders, you know, this and that. Uh, don't let them come. Stop them in Panama. You know, you, you hear all the things you hear. Uh, no, we don't want to see work permits. It's a pool factor, right? As if like a sandwich in this really hot place that they're in where people have malaria is a pool factor. Anyway, sidetrack. But what they would say to you, though, a number of them is, but if you bring back the bill, the Promise and Dream Act bill, the, the Dreamers is different. They've been here as children. It wasn't their fault they were brought. And there's enough of those that I want to actually call and see if there's a bluff, right? Put the discharge petition, get them to sign it. But for us to do that, we have to have every single Democrat sign as a co-sponsor. So please go check if your if your congressperson isn't one, and please ask them to become a co-sponsor as soon as possible. I'll be whipping for for, for co-sponsors this week as well. And it's HR 16, American Dream and Promise Act of 2023. Okay, so I'm putting exactly into right, the, the priority bill. Right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna place into chat everybody. For everyone to see, 
the congress.gov, which is sometimes a few days behind. So in fact, it, it, as we hopefully gain more co-sponsors over the next week to 10 days, per uh, what uh, Representative Ramirez will be pushing in Congress, sometimes this site is a little slow to add the names, but as of right now, this should be an up-to-date list. It has 173 co-sponsors. So check to see if your member is. And um, and obviously, we, we would love to assist uh, in the messaging, but please take the initiative yourself. If your congressperson is not on there, especially if they're a Democrat, but also if they're a Republican, you know, send a letter, give a call into the office and demand, ask that they become uh, a co-sponsor of this legislation. Um, and that's across the board. Now, on the call the other day, you, you talked about, I was amazed because you, you were as, as, as eloquent as anyone on the call about how difficult it can be to be a squad member, to be a strong, you know, young, progressive person of color inside the U.S. Congress. Um, how, how difficult is it to, <laughs> to interact in that environment with the Republicans and everything? Uh, what, what's it like? I mean, maybe, I, I don't mean it just, it's maybe the closest we come to a point of levity. How absurd is it? I mean. Well, I mean, look, yeah, I am a minority among the minority of the minority, right? So right. There's, there are those challenges as well. It, I, I can, Illinois is a super majority democratic state. Right. Uh, I think at this point, if we have, I think we have like 41 uh, Republicans in the state house out of 118, if that, maybe less at this point. Um, and I, I served in the state legislature, and I was, I was the most progressive in leadership in my state house. So I, part of my challenge was I, I was used to being able to deliver and deliver quickly, and now coming into a Congress of 435 of absolute dysfunction, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a it's a big contrast, and at the same time, what I have said over and over is there is no excuse to not do everything you can to deliver in the ways you can for your constituents. Mm -hmm. My constituents have asked, figure out how to get resources for affordable housing, and I was able to secure fourteen point one million dollars back to my district through the community project funding. Of course, that took forever, right? Because it took forever to get a budget. But that meant that I was able to fund 100 units of affordable housing in my district, which is expensive <laughs> to, to fund. So you could, 100 units, was uh, it's a lot of money for 100 units, but these are 100 new units in my district. And there's this idea that if you are progressive, if you are a squad member or however people see you as, as the left part of the of the party that you can get things done and for me it's incredibly important to be able to demonstrate that me coming into congress i don't go to congress for messaging i go to congress to deliver because it is exactly what those that send me there are expecting of me right. and it is actually the only way you begin to change the relationship between people and government that people can actually dare to imagine that a government can work for them and that the person that they've sent there actually speaks their language and has ways to prove with tangible deliverables that they are delivering for them, right? Tomorrow, I head back to D.C. and I will be presenting in debate my very first bill for a vote tomorrow evening. Awesome. I will have done more than Speaker McCarthy did. <laughs> I'm a speaker. When I passed my bipartisan student veteran restoration bill. Wow. Just That's a incredible. quick little note. Yeah. I won't tell you who. Maybe another squad member is also getting her bill called on the House floor on suspension tomorrow as well. well I won't I, I, I can't spell for her, so she'll she'll tell you you will know when it happens. But two squad members are going to have their bill on the floor. As a you know, freshman, yeah. that's almost impossible to have a standalone bill. You can have amendments. It's very different. A standalone bill coming to the House floor that will restore benefits for 50,000 veterans who've been defrauded by for-profit schools. And, and you're, now you're saying the other, the other person who has their bill possibly is a freshman as well? I'm not saying anything else. 
Okay. Now get me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know we, exactly that. If you, if I answer that question, you I know. have the answer. Yeah. There's only two of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay. That's a question. Aren't there nine squad members now? Not eight. I mean, right. It, I mean, Greg, Summer, and yourself are freshmen, so they're three. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think people see. I think people see it. Um, you know, it's like it's one of, not one of those like you join with a caucus and phase, right? It's just right, the way right. that we all work together. And right. Greg, off, Greg is is part of you know he he votes with us. I think almost a hundred percent. He is one of my closest friends, and I think it's depending on how you see it. Um, he's okay. not on the squad thread, but it doesn't mean he's not um, oh. you know squad adjacent or or certainly a partner. Yeah, I know Greg. Well, heck, yeah, it should, it should get on the thread. Uh, but yeah, I, we, we we all love Greg. Um, but no. um, well, and you had asked me. I just want to wrap this yeah. part up. You said how difficult it is. Uh huh. It would have been absolutely unimaginable if it weren't that I came in to Congress with Greg Kassar, Summer Lee, and even Robert Garcia, uh, who is also a progressive from Long Beach. Moves, right. uh, you know, his mm-hmm. thoughts are a bit different in some ways. Uh, class president. But, but the four of us have been really intentional about building community together and uplifting each other. Congress oftentimes is a place where people go and compete with one another. And instead of building up or tearing down, we are very intentional about making sure that we're in a space we're also bringing the other. Or we're co-sponsoring each other's bills. Or we're checking in with each other. How do you feel after that vote? What do you need to be able to take that vote? That level of community is critical for us to not just survive in that place, but be able to thrive and bring more people along. Yeah, I've been able to, I've been honored to do events and fundraisers with about five of the squad members and uh, have, you know, rapport now with, uh, if you count it up to nine, then it's seven of the squad members. And of course, other other fellow travelers, Pramila Jayapal, Ro Khanna, Maxwell Frost, Absolutely. et cetera. And, um, but um um, Rashida Sleeb was the first SWAT member I got to know pretty well. And um, I just maybe a final question for me and then quickly from just two, maybe two questions from two people here. And we'll, we'll get you out by the top of the hour. We got to move over to getting our congressional uh, activism around supporting permanent ceasefire going in the next hour. But, um, um, you know, and again, on the call at midweek, you talked about what it, what it's like to be able to work with the fellow SWAT members. And I was on a call not long ago with both Corey and Rashida. And when Corey was speaking about Rashida, Rashida had to keep turning off her video because you know she, you knew she was crying because she was so mm-hmm. touched by Corey and and obviously Corey's courage and in in you know obviously leading and and putting forward the first ceasefire bill and all of you signed on to it. And you know Rashida Talib to me is somebody who has such a beautiful heart, and I think she's really one of the most important. Uh, politicians in the country and in the world right now uh, for the position that she occupies. And maybe just on the squad people in general, I mean, y'all just seem like beautiful souls. And it's so baffling to see the negative animus that people throw at the squad members. There are a couple of squad members I don't know, as I just mentioned. Um, but um, boy, the, the heart and the courage of the group that, that has been exhibited over the past few months is something that certainly everyone on this call and everyone at PDA, we, we exist to support y'all. And um, I think it's amazing to have such an incredible group of, of relatively young leaders uh, in American politics at this moment. So just your thoughts on the kind of uh, yeah. community that you guys experienced. Well, let me start out by saying that uh, we are an extension of the community that has built us. Yeah. I mean, what you see in us and why we extend grace, even when grace is not extended to us, is because of the, of the community, of all of you, all, of all of you that make it possible for us to continue to be courageous. There are good days and there are hard days there, and sometimes there are more hard days than good days. Right. But being able to know that we have you making calls, checking in with us, endorsing us, supporting us, uplifting us, or, you know, sometimes even defending us, right, um, and, and demonstrating that you could be progressive, you could be young, you can be a person of color, and you can deliver. And how important that is for people to have that community that backs them. I think it's so important. So we're an extension of that. I also have to say to you that I believe that Rashida Talib is the most compassionate, loving person yeah. on this planet. Oh, yeah. 
This woman shows grace and extends compassion to people that dehumanize her to her face. People that are willing to silence her and censure her. She can still look into their eyes with love and compassion and acceptance. How one person can have so much love. You know, one of our colleagues says she has experienced so much. She has seen so much hate that she turns it around and, and has decided, every time you send me hate, I'm going to send you love. And, and that, to me, is deeply powerful and almost rare <laughs> to see yeah. in, in most people. I call her a mama bear. I, I, say, I say to her, how yeah. is it that you have all the worry of Palestinian people, of community, of your district, of your children, of your siblings, of your mm. mother. And somehow you remember everyone's birthday. You send them little notes, care packages. You check in on people, squad or not squad. You make people feel seen, even those that try to dehumanize and make you look unseen. It, it's unbelievable. And I'm going to tell you, I, I, I want to put in some kind of... Um, either the a commendation or resolution to make her saint because I truly think she's a saint. Well, actually I'm, I'm thinking up something that, that me and some friends are conspiring about that. Hopefully you'll hear about soon that I think we'll do, uh, will honor appropriately the level of what you all are doing on the national and global stage at this hour. By the way, we, we are following, uh, our next guest is, is the, President of Peace Action, and uh, he did he did DM me. So sorry about this, Kevin, but he said I think it's appropriate for you to know too. Peace Action as well fully fully supports both you and the squad, and I think that's just part of the uh, moment we're at right now. Okay, quick, uh, very quickly, Dorothy Reich, Danette, Neil, and David, and we're gonna. Well, David is not David, somebody else, but the four people have their hands up. You all get a quick thought you all only have about 45 seconds because we got to run but dorothy you're up then danette then neil then david and uh and then delia will be out your thoughts dorothy right hi delia it's so amazing i mean i've been hi. around a time because i'm old and to see people of your caliber in the and the squad in the congress is so heartwarming and so wonderful because mm. there haven't been people like you in government in the past so Thank God you're there. We're going to do everything to support you. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you were talking about immigration, that it seems that Biden is considering uh, cutting back on asylum, cutting off the entry of asylum seekers to this country. Uh, and I wanted to know if you've heard anything about that and if there's anybody doing anything to try to stop him. Thank um, you. A number of us are. <laughs> and we need you too. So look, I, I have said at the beginning that uh, part of what I've been really concerned about is that we are now beginning to sound um, like Republicans and with a lot of the same Republican mm -hmm. rhetoric. Uh, limit the number of people that can seek asylum. There's even been language floated around around mass detention. The last bill, the, la the, the, <laughs> the remaining appropriation bills that we uh, voted on about two weeks ago had um, funding for more detention beds. Uh, funding for more uh, deportations. I didn't vote for it. I couldn't vote for that. <laughs> it's so inconsistent with who we say we are. And certainly there was $3.1 billion for Israel, which was voted on um, in the appropriation budget. So what you're seeing is um, the president uh, is feeling this pressure. I have to show that I can be the most toughest on border. And that is what the Senate bill that came to the House floor, but uh, Speaker Johnson doesn't want to bring to the floor, in my case, thankfully, uh, that would really actually take us back to some of the most draconian anti-asylum policies. And here's the biggest problem with that, that if we voted on that or if the president ends up using executive action, which he's now considering, right, around some border um, policy that would limit and, 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 and start using more detention and deportation, that... God forbid, we don't want to think about it, but I'm going to just throw it out there. But if Trump becomes president, that becomes permanent policy that he will just add more because he's in this competition to show that he is the king deporter, right? The porter in chief. So can you imagine what that would do when we permanently legislate 
through a supplemental budget, draconian immigration laws that will then, regardless if it's Trump or not, but now it's a permanent legislation that Congress has passed. So it's absolutely, absolutely dangerous. A number of us, including especially with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal as a CPC chair, has been leading the forefront, Congressman Garcia and others, sending letters to the administration, calling the administration both publicly and privately, and, and saying, you cannot do Republican things and expect me to be able to prove to the people that you are so different than Trump when it comes to immigration law. And that this idea that he has to show that he's tough on border it could, it's going to end up permanently devastating, while at the same time, nothing being done around immigration here. So what we are saying is, how about expanded work permits? How about addressing issues of inflation? Because that's what constituents are at, talking about, how they can't afford their rent. They can't afford, you know, gas money. I mean, the list goes on. How about looking at parole in place, work permits? Yes, technology so that we can address the issues of fentanyl on the border or being able to fund more administrative offices to help process asylum cases. There are things we could be doing, but we don't have to sound like Donald Trump. And so I really appreciate you asking that question. The answer is yes, it's very real. And we have to be able to stand up and organize and say we cannot be the party of deportation and detention. We have to be the party that upholds asylum as a human right. Thank you. And I also do want to say thank you also earlier for you bringing in the whole scope of U.S. foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere into what's being discussed well, because there's so much that needs to be reset. But alas, we are running out of time. Danette, you have 30 seconds, and then probably, sorry, Neil, David, and Barbara, we're probably going to have to let um, uh, Delia go. Um, And Danette, you're up. Yes, thank you, Delia. My uh, camera's not working, so I apologize. But thank you so much for standing up for what's right and standing on the right side of history when so many refuse to do that. Um, I I can't tell you how much hope that gives people um, in this very dark time in history. Um, My question to you is, how can you get Biden's ear on this? Public pressure is working, but the, um, the needle is not moving far enough, fast enough to get this genocide ended yesterday. Um, do you feel like you have enough of a relationship with the rest of the squad to maybe get that meeting with him and tell him you are hemorrhaging votes daily because of this? Um, Mm -hmm. and we, none of us want Trump. I'm terrified. If he gets back in, it's the end of everything as we know it. And I know, you know that too, but I also don't want to vote for a person who supports genocide. And I know a lot of people, I'm an activist in California, a lot of people, um, Palestinian Americans that I'm active with, uh, will absolutely not vote for Biden, even if he changes um, course right now. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Danette. Thank you for your question. Your floor, Delia. Yeah. Thank you. So, so look, all of us have been saying this directly to the administration, either collectively or individually. I was just in a meeting, actually, with his campaign, uh, who wanted to ask questions about how to activate young people. And of course, when when the question, you know, when the slide was up on what young people were concerned about, um, Gaza was not included in that list. So I raised my hand and said, uh, I'm going to, there's a big elephant in the room, and I'm just going to call it out, and I'm going to bring that elephant into public view. And I said, uh, every single day you're going to lose more and more young people. They're not to Donald Trump. They're not going to vote for him. Of course not. We all understand how terrible he is. But if you continue to say that you are privately angry at Netanyahu while publicly still enforcing the same policy that is killing civilians and violating international law, that you are only going to lose more and more people, and it is only going to be the administration to blame. And, you know, so I, I was told that they're hearing that loud and clear. The polls are showing um, that they um, are trying to change course and that they, are, that they believe that their priority right now is to get to a six-week, um, a temporary ceasefire. Uh, what I have said is a temporary ceasefire is not going to prevent us from a regional war, only a permanent one. If, if you want to see Iran withdraw, if you want to see peace actually a possibility, 
we need a permanent ceasefire. So a number of us are having these conversations. And what I said also, and I think it's important, I said to them very loud and clear, and they knew what I was talking about. I said, but, but, some, but you having some of your surrogates going around and saying, get over it, as we heard, unfortunately, Secretary Clinton say just recently, get over yourself. That is not going to get you to have people to want to vote for the president. People need to know that they are heard, they are seen, and that, that, that not only are you hearing them, but you are responding to their call. So, yes, we are saying this around the clock, and more of the Congressional Progressive Caucus members are also saying this directly to the campaign. None of us want to see Donald Trump elected, but this idea that you're going to blame people who don't want to see us use money to kill children for Donald Trump is also unacceptable. It's putting blame on the wrong people when really the blame is on us. Well, as a final way of, of closing out, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And also, by the way, it was uh, just pointed out to me in a direct message in the chat to thank you for being a signer on the letter to invoke NSM 20, uh, that Israel is violating U.S. law and restricting humanitarian assistance and therefore should not receive U.S. military aid. Thank you so much for that. Another example of your brave leadership and the leadership of, of your allies within the House and in Congress. And um, it's just great to have you here. And um, wow, you are an amazing, amazing uh, addition to the U.S. House of Representatives. We are thrilled that you've won your primary and in, in great likelihood will be returning, of course, to the House. But we will all encourage everybody in the 3rd District, Illinois, to support you as we've officially endorsed you. And let's make sure all the other squad members win their primaries. Everybody on the call. Right. Delia That's Ramirez, right. thank you so much. And your final thoughts. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's make sure we're that we are phone banking for summer relief. If people are able to go to Pittsburgh, go and knock on those doors. I get my roommate reelected. Uh, I need her in Congress. And, and finally, oh. I dream and work for a world where we no longer have to celebrate first and only. Yes. When I got elected, I became the very first uh, Latina in the Midwest to come to Congress. And it is our responsibility to continue to break those glass ceilings, but we don't have to wait for the first woman, for the first person of color, for the first this, for the first that. The work that you do as Progressive Democrats of America is the only way we break these glass ceilings. It is the only way we create a world where working families can thrive. So thank you for pouring into us and thank you for helping us and affirming us so that we can continue to be courageous in this particular moment, in this precise moment, to lead such a time as this. We are with you 100%, Delia Ramirez. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. And we are a little bit past the top of the hour. That was amazing from Representative Ramirez. And boy, uh, this is what we do here, absolutely what we do here at PDA. And we uh, want to see more and more members of Congress in alignment with Representative Ramirez. Uh, you know, apologies to the people who are on stack we couldn't get to. But right now, very quickly before we go to Kevin Martin, the president of Peace Action, Mike Fox with our to-dos. And folks, of course, one of the to-dos we every Sunday we have our goal of money raised. Please give what you can to make sure we reach our goal. This uh, very packed town hall, the next hour, everybody should stay on is going to be incredibly important, folks. Um, just as important as the first hour is we're going to be engaging in some activism that is necessary for this historic moment. Mike Fox, how are we doing on those PDA to-dos? Thank you, Alan, and I will be brief with my favorite job of the week. The following people have been kind enough to donate. Nurse Judy, thank you so much at $100 for more than kind donation. And Walt and Mimi Kennedy, thank you so much, sister, for your more than kind $250. And Bob and Jean and Carol and Neil and phone banker Aaron, double dipping, and phone banker Jane, double dipping, and phone banker Betsy. <laughs> Excuse me, and Nadine, Dorothy, you're more than kind $100. As always, thank you, sister. Phone banker Erica, Deborah, phone banker Mary, phone banker Carl, triple dipper Carl, who likewise knocks doors every day, every uh, week of his life. Uh, double dipping Dr. Deutsch, uh, Clayton, 
Mary and Michael. And uh, we're about halfway to go right now. I'll toss the link into the chat, how to make that happen. Uh, we've had several folks sign up for the phone bank, but we're behind on that. So just like the good representative said, we got to be on the phone for Summer Lee this week. I'll be putting the link into the chat. If you do not see that, go to pdamerica.org slash volunteer and sign up for an hour. If you do not see the donation link, go to pdamerica.org america.org hit that donation button toss in whatever you can we've had some wonderful large dollar donors today thank you for that folks uh but primarily what we're looking for here is just solidarity if everybody on this call who has not yet donated just tosses in five bucks, bang, we nail it. Solidarity. Uh, and we'll discuss where we're at uh, from a to-do standpoint, these things and more uh, during family time. So stick around. Back to you, Alan. Muted. There we go. So um, apologies, Barbara Wimsat. We will get to you. You'll be first on stack when we get back to a stack period. But right now, I'm really honored to introduce Kevin Martin, who is the president of Peace Action. And um, we are uh, in coordination with Peace Action in what we will be doing this upcoming week with Tuesday as our target date. So for those who were not here at the top of the hour, um, we, I'm going to uh, put or Danette, if you can, again, put into chat um, the way that people can access the letter that we will be sending out. And I'll be making reference to that after we hear from uh, Kevin Martin, who is, again, has Peace Action, has led this coordinated effort of a bunch of groups to call for a ceasefire in the period from April 9th to 19th, and here to tell us more about it. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, it's a real pleasure to, to follow Representative Ramirez, who Peace Action also supports. And uh, as I prompted Alan to thank her that she has signed on <laughs> to one of the congressional initiatives to raise the concern of Israel being out of compliance with U.S. and international humanitarian law and therefore should be ineligible for military aid. And I'll talk a little bit more about that specifically. Uh, but first, just to say hello to many of my PDA friends, uh, my association with PDA goes all the way back pretty much to the founding of the organization. So mm -hmm. uh, it's great to be with you here today. So uh, Peace Action has worked on Palestine and Israel for a long time, but usually not as one of our top priorities. But since October 7th and then the response by Israel, uh, it has taken up almost all of our time. And we found the end of last year, the beginning of this year, sort of an unusual niche for us to fulfill, which is grassroots coordination on congressional advocacy, which, of course, is one of the hardest aspects of our work. At the end of last year, beginning of this year, we identified 18 target states around the country, and we helped to mobilize uh, local coalitions in those states to lobby the Senate around the Jumbo Supplemental Appropriations Bill. Uh, that I'll refer to that in a little bit as well. Uh, so we've had an ongoing uh, coordinating function. And now for these advocacy days that we're in the middle of, April 9th to 19th, uh, I believe we're going to have well over 500. And with PDA piling on, it could be well over 600 individuals participating, about 50 organizations from about 40 states, and visits with well over 100 congressional offices, some virtual, some on Capitol Hill. There have been people on Capitol Hill last week and also this week. Our four major core demands are ceasefire now, immediate and lasting ceasefire, uh, surge humanitarian aid into the region, including restoring funding for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. Um, no military aid to Israel, especially as Israel is committing war crimes and genocide and avoiding a wider regional war. And the timing uh, has worked out to be maybe a little bit more prescient than we would have liked it to be. And uh, with yesterday's strike by uh, Iran, uh, we actually decided to call an emergency Zoom for later tonight, actually 6.30 Eastern, for the people that are participating uh, in the uh, advocacy days. And you guys are lucky. You don't have to get on that Zoom at 6.30 necessarily because you already have uh, your piece in progress. 
So uh, what is um, probably the most uh, important thing is calling for the ceasefire, because if there is a ceasefire, that helps tamp down the possibility of a regional war, and it makes the delivery of humanitarian aid you know, much more uh, possible. Now, the piece about no aid to Israel, uh, as of before yesterday, or even it's still, still possible today, there are a number of congressional initiatives all around enforcing existing U.S. law and policy to restrict or prohibit military aid to Israel. So it's not that Congress or the administration actually needs to pass a new law. If it would simply implement and enforce and adhere to existing U.S. law, that would make a huge difference and send a huge uh, message to Israel that they cannot continue business as usual with blank check, endless support from the United States and, and from our tax dollars. Now, the aid package to Israel that was part of the jumbo, originally $110 billion supplemental, most of it is, is aid to Ukraine, but also to Taiwan. There's actually some pork for weapons contractors in the form of money for new nuclear submarines and also some humanitarian aid, but also with the $14 billion uh, in military aid for Israel that passed the Senate uh, several months ago at this point, has been held up in the House. And I have always thought that military aid to Israel would get through the House and that Israel would get its money in one form or another, whether they split that off as a separate vote or whether it's part of the big jumbo supplemental. And remember, the administration has continued to deliver weapons to Israel on an ongoing basis. And what they do is they are able to do it under the threshold that requires congressional reporting. I think it's either 200 million or 250 million. If they do a weapons transfer that's below that threshold, it just goes through and they don't even have to notify Congress. So the U.S. support, uh, military support for Israel has been, you know, ongoing. There are also some, like Bernie Sanders, for example, and others, make an exception for so-called defensive weapons, Iron Dome or David Sling. And of course, you know, just the, the attack by Iran over the weekend was a pretty good commercial, I guess, for the weapons contractors involved in missile defense, that they were able to sh shoot down most of those incoming Iranian missiles. Um, but leaving that aside for a minute, there has been growing pressure on the administration, and it's due to our work. It's due to our congressional advocacy. It's due to many of the votes in the primaries where people voted uncommitted or no preference or other ways made their displeasure with Biden and his support for Israel known. Uh, and it has, as, as painstaking as it's been, like pulling teeth, there is more and more congressional pressure to at least condition military aid. Now, where we are since the attack uh, by Iran just over the weekend, it's possible that the House may vote as soon as tomorrow on Israel aid. And we don't know if it will be standalone or if it will be the jumbo supplemental package. And just to try to uh, simplify this, if they pass the same supplemental that inc includes Ukraine and Taiwan, et cetera, that was passed in the Senate, and if they pass it as soon as tomorrow, that bill would then go to Biden's desk for signature, presumably as soon as Tuesday morning, and presumably Biden would sign it. And then we still have our you know, genuine and, and uh, righteous demands for a ceasefire, for humanitarian aid, for stopping a wider regional war. But all these let's enforce U.S. law, and there's at least three or four initiatives underway uh, to try to enforce U.S. law to either stop or prohibit or restrict or limit weapon sales to Israel would be for the immediate uh, uh, time period obviated because the money will have you know been appropriated and gone through. There are still valid points to make going forward, and there might be a lot of hand-wringing and, and complaining in Congress, but the thing is if the money is going out the door, if they voted for it, um, then these concerns have to be continue to press them, but wouldn't you know stop this aid going forward. So that is my really quick overview. Uh, again, the, the four points that we have agreed to, again, our coalition with about 50 organizations, uh, and we're doing work in about 40 different states with well over 500, I think it'll be over 600 individuals, are ceasefire, restore UNRWA aid and surge humanitarian aid to avoid famine, uh, no weapons to Israel while it's committing these war crimes, 
and stopping the wider regional war. And of course, stopping the wider regional war is all the more important right now. And I think there's a lot of uh, logic to these, these demands being linked. Um, so that was my quick update. I don't know if that's quicker than you wanted, Alan. But no, it's uh, perfect. It's fantastic. But because I, I have a follow up, first of all, I was going to do this. Let's let's do it this way. I was going to read the version of the letter we had, which was drawn from your letter. Which, by the way, in the letter draft you had, you didn't have the fourth point included, the expansion of the regional war. And so people take a note. I do want to remind people right now: if you go to the latest link that Danette put in the chat to access that. Uh, the one with the bold writing here is the ceasefire letter. Here, I'll just copy entirely what Danette wrote in the bold lettering. Hopefully, the bold lettering will carry over. It looks like it is. I'll send it to everyone right now. There we go. And um, if you look at it, um, it, just let's do this part of this right now before we go to the stack. And then I'll come back and read the letter and get Kevin's thoughts. And, uh, and we'll all be mobilized to send this in on Tuesday to your congressman. And you probably want to address it to the legislative director. And that research right now is on you. We'll be explaining it more on Monday's call if you want. But again, I would recommend sending it to addressed to the congressperson is the way we actually do it at PDA, uh, Kevin. But then send it to the legislative director, maybe the chief of staff, if you can figure that out as well. The ledge director and then ask for a meeting and follow up with a phone call. And um, you'll, you, we, it's on you to figure out how to call and to send in. Uh, we'll put the um, house uh, directory into the chat in a little bit to find the ledge director. But um, on Monday, we'll go through how to contact those people. But right now, if you go to the document, the best way to access it so that you have your own version of it is when you open up the doc.google.com that is in the link, and you look on the upper left-hand corner of the document, on the front page, there's a file section. You click on that and then just scroll down to where it says download. It'll give you some choices. I recommend just taking old fashioned Microsoft Word and downloading it into a Microsoft Word document by clicking on that as, as I just did as an example. I didn't share my screen, but it takes a second to do. And then you'll have your own copy right there. Thank you so much, uh, Danette, with that. And then if we can also put it when, if you have the time to put in uh, your uh, the house uh, directory, you can find the name of your legislative director there as well. Okay, so let's go to the stack. And Barbara, you're up, then Neil, then John. Barbara. Please unmute, Barbara. Okay, you're having trouble unmuting. Uh, Neil, can you unmute first? We'll come back to Barbara. Oh, Barbara just unmuted. Barbara, go ahead. So, um, yeah, it's so complicated. I'm not sure where to start. Um, but I think that some of these issues are more complicated than has been discussed. For instance, about immigration. Um, you know, I think a lot of the flow of immigration has to do with U.S. interventions in a lot of these countries like Venezuela and Colombia. Um, and I think we need to address that, not just say, oh, well, let's just have immigrants, immigrants. I mean, oh. you know, it's so D I think. Delia, Delia did bring that up. But with Kevin here, if you have a question specifically about the ceasefire efforts or um, coming. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, I, I think the U.S. somehow gets involved in these conflicts um, and undercover, you know. And uh, then we have to say, oh, you know, let's stop it. And, and in addition, we are not really addressing what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine. Um, so, I mean, all these things need to be brought back in. And that's that's Thank about you. all I can say for now. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Kevin, about that, what's you, what, how, uh, you know, obviously we're always, as peace advocates, in a peculiar situation inside the United States of America. On the one hand, as the global hegemon, and as I suppose what Mersheimer calls still the most important country inside the global system, actions we take here can have influence in ways that would seem not to be available in other countries. But at the same time, um, just how entrenched and how outside of our capacity to influence things the U.S. foreign policy establishment and brain trust is 
can seem daunting. In general, how does peace action approach that paradox, set of paradoxes? Well, I think that's all true. And for peace action, we embrace all the tools in the social cha uh, change box, so social change toolbox. Uh, so we work on elections like PDA does, but not a lot of peace groups do, frankly. We right. lobby Congress, we do demonstrations, we sometimes do people-to-people -people diplomacy, we sometimes do acts of, acts of conscience where people risk arrest, et cetera. And I, I think that uh, one of the, the main things, especially in terms of U.S. military action around the world, in addition to speaking out against U.S. support for or U.S. participation in various wars or occupations, is the effort to retake some democracy and especially congressional authority. Mm. Unfortunately, Congress has given up its authority for decades now. Right. You know, the Constitution is very clear that only uh, the Congress can declare war. Well, they haven't done that since World War II, and yet we find ourselves in wars all the time. So, uh, you know, since uh, the last five or six years, Barbara Lee has certainly been one of the leaders on this. Even Tim Kaine on the Senate side, even though he's not a super progressive peacenik, uh, right. taking back congressional authority, revoking the authorizations for the use of military force from 20 plus years ago, et cetera. Uh, so I think raising those issues as well, that uh, we want more peace, we want more diplomacy, we want more realistic solutions to international conflict. And one of the better ways to do that is to democratize foreign policy, getting more people involved. I mean, right now you have zero Republicans who are for a ceasefire. And half of them, or maybe more, support Israel because they want the rapture to come sooner. So I don't know how you even talk to them. I, I can't even imagine how you can talk to them, right? But even in the Progressive Caucus, there are still a number that haven't called for a ceasefire. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, our work is uh, a lot about persistence, obviously, advocating for the right thing. And, and also just look at the polls. The polls show that most Americans want a ceasefire. And yet it's like pulling teeth to get a lot of uh, members of Congress. So, you know, the, the I guess, quick answer that I think PDA believes in, as, as well as Peace Action, is more organizing, more people power, more democracy. And if we can bring more democracy rather than just elite policy decision in, in Washington and Ivy League institutions or wherever, the better the foreign policy would be for people in this country and also for around the world. You know, here, here. And um, yeah, of course, with PDA, too, we also we try to hold to being inside outside. So really also having engagement with. Uh, obviously, activists on the ground and social movements across the board. Um, Ro Khanna and Bernie, didn't they both also make a push for the reaffirmation of the Congress taking control of the, is that correct, or around the Yemen uh, uh, issue? Yeah. yeah, so the the war powers resolution that many of us worked on specifically around Yemen was quite remarkable. Right. And it's actually somewhat of a success story. And I wrote a chapter right. about this for a journal that's coming out. We did pass the war power resolution, but then Trump vetoed it and there weren't the votes to override it. But over, you know, it started under Obama and then Trump and then Biden, various levels of U.S. support for the Saudi led slaughter in Yemen. But because of our persistence as a grassroots movement, we basically more or less, and this is a, a very um, general description, got the government of Saudi Arabia, which is one of the worst governments in the world to understand that it just was no longer worth their while to continue because not necessarily they wouldn't have the support of the presidents, but because they couldn't count on the support of Congress. We raised enough doubt that Congress would either condition or stop or, you know, yeah, using the war powers resolution. Uh, it also maybe made a difference that the Houthis were able to launch missiles that could strike into Saudi Arabia. I think, you know, they mm -hmm. had an aura of invincibility that was pierced. But we basically got Saudi Arabia to, to think that it just wasn't worth it to continue the war. There's a fragile peace in Yemen, um, and hopefully that can be resumed. The peace process needs to be supported and, and hopefully uh, made more concrete. But for now, it is somewhat of a of grassroots organizing success and advocacy success story. Um, Neil, your, uh, your comment or uh, question for uh, Kevin. Yes, it's more of a comment. Uh... Kevin, I agree with everything you're saying. I equally was thrilled with everything I heard Congresswoman Ramirez saying. And uh, the point about organizing is how do we build critical mass? Uh, I'd like to uh, encourage my fellow PDFers 
in during the Juneteenth celebrations, which will occur in just about every metropolitan area in the country, this is an incredible outreach opportunity to reach out to the progressive African American community and on a level of partnership and also whatever Caucasians that show up at these events, uh, it's like shooting fish in the barrel. These are persons who, if they hear the PDF message, are going to be saying, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of damn sense. Um, hey, thank you. But um, PDA, of course, PDF, we'd be a stagnant uh, word for that. Yeah. <laughs> you meant to say PDA. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I love you. Yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but hey, um, um, one question. Though. Then John, John, and Mimi will close the stack at Mimi. So don't anybody else jump on. I'm just going to frustrate you because I'm going to then return. I want to read the letter we've composed before uh, Kevin has to leave, and also um, obviously he mentioned he has a very important meeting coming up. I'll be on that meeting too. Um, and then Mimi Kennedy is going to come forward and uh, and and put forward an idea that I'd also love for Kevin to hear. So we got to move quickly here. But Kevin, um, sole authority. I'm getting involved in an initiative to try to block uh, the nuclear sole authority right of the U.S. president. Uh, Danette, you, you're sharing the screen. We're going to go to John and Mimi first, so please hold off on that. Thank you. And um, uh, I imagine Peace Action supports the ending of sole authority for nuclear use, right? Yeah, talk about your lack of democracy. Yeah. So there's a great <laughs> book on this that a, a Harvard professor, professor named Elaine Scarry uh, wrote a few years ago that's called Thermonuclear Monarchy. And it's a very simple premise. What could be less democratic than one person having the authority to end life on Earth? And in this case, it, it's all men in terms of the leaders of the nine nuclear states that all have sole authority in the chief executive, the president or prime minister, who whatever it is, that on their own authority, they could start a nuclear war, which again, could end life on Earth. So yes, we very much uh, support that effort. Yeah, and for what it's worth, we're gonna I'm, we're involved in an initiative. I'll be in touch about it with you, of course, um, and Peace Action because we figure um, the threat of Trump could mobilize the Democrats to action on that front. So we're gonna do our best just chance to do that. Well, yeah. and it's it's interesting that you say that because the original bill that was introduced it got more attention under Trump, but it was actually introduced when Obama was still president. So, and the way that I talk about this is, I don't think Gandhi should have, I don't think any one person no. should just yes. be able to start yeah. a nuclear war. Uh, when we get to uh, talking about Congress more, there was one clarification about possible Senate action that I want to get to, but uh, glad to hear other folks' questions or comments first. John Seeley, please unmute. Yeah, I, I did. Um, well, uh, I used to uh, share an office with Peace Action in LA. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to ask you, because I was never totally clear about this, in terms of broad, you know, what is the base building strategy in terms of, you know, expanding our advocacy, our, you know, our troops and our, our well, our advocacy. Uh, I mean, as a Vietnam era veteran, uh, you know, it seems to me the, the pillars of the anti-war movement were the, the students in the academy, you know, on the one hand, the veterans and the churches, to some extent, were a very important uh, factor in supporting uh, anti-war things. And I'm wondering whether you feel that either your organization or the broader coalition in general should, you know, is doing much in terms of reaching out to those groups and helping mobilize them. And uh, where do you think we should be? focusing our, our, our uh, building efforts. Thank you, John. That's a really good question. And I could go on for a long time about that in general, but let me be specific about what's going on with this grassroots ceasefire now network. Uh, we are seeing a real surge in Palestinian, Arab American, Muslim, and also Iranian American groups and individuals getting involved, not just organizations, individuals. A lot of churches or, or faith-based organizations and as a matter of fact, uh, one of my Palestinian Muslim uh, activist colleagues is working on getting a, an interfaith or an ecumenical letter going. But just this last week, Churches for Middle East Peace, which has been around for 30 years or more, they had their advocacy days in Washington, and we were encouraging people to go to that too. And I've been very heartened to see 
unions coming out for a ceasefire. Now, I'll just say that a lot of the unions are kind of doing their own thing. A lot of them have not been joining or or participating in our actions, but that's okay. They're operating on a very important level and you know doing their own actions. So that to me is kind of the snapshot of how we are building this grassroots network. And again, we're winning the battle for public opinion. Pretty much every poll you look at says people want a ceasefire. It's the elites and the policymakers in Washington who are deaf to that because of all kinds of things, including their money from APAC. Uh, one of the things that we are part of, and this is a 501c4 campaign, is the Reject APAC campaign, which is to oppose and expose APAC's malign influence and mm-hmm. really make make APAC toxic. They are a lot like the NRA, uh, except for probably even worse, because APAC in no way represents the opinions of Jewish voters in this country. Jewish voters in this country are generally liberal and pro-peace. They're not pro-apartheid like APAC is. Thank you so much. Look, Francis and Alex, I closed the stack after Mimi because we are so short on time. You'll be able to speak after we get through the part with Mimi. I apologize. So uh, Mimi, keep your hands up if you like, but Mimi's going to be the last person for Kevin. Mimi, you're up. Hi, everyone. Mimi Sheher, Northern California. Thank you for the fantastic program today. And, and thank you, Kevin, for your insights. That's really great to hear. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the letters today, but um, I was wondering, Kevin, how um, I, I've been working for uh, volunteering for human rights for many decades now. Um, I was and, and um, our American politicians are breaking the law. And how can we emphasize that? Um, and maybe that's addressed in the letter. So thank you. That was my short, appreciative uh, comment. Well, and that somewhat gets me back to, uh, and if you can just hang with me for a minute in terms of congressional procedure, which I know sometimes make people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> if if the House in the next day or two passes the identical bill, the jumbo supplemental appropriations that has money for Ukraine and Taiwan as well as as well as Israel, if they pass that, then it just goes right to uh, the president's desk. However, if they pass something different, that gives us at least a window, and it could be a short window, for some senators. And there are a few senators looking at at least three or four different approaches to try to stop or prohibit or limit or condition military aid to Israel. They may have an opportunity to throw some sand in the gears because they haven't passed the same bill that the House passed. So either they have to vote on that bill or there has to be a conference committee or a negotiation between the House and the Senate, maybe with the White House. And then we would have to mobilize very quickly with our Senate allies who are looking at, as you say, existing U.S. law and policy. It's not that they need to pass new laws. Israel is in violation six ways to Sunday about you know existing U.S. law and humanitarian law. It's a matter of upholding and enforcing existing law. Okay, so I'm right now I'm going to, uh, Danette, if you could throw the letter up, I'm going to read it and just uh, probably there really won't be much time for comment because we're going to go to Mimi Kennedy. Um, I have a call with New Mexico uncommitted. I have a call with a strategy for PDA fundraising that I have to be on all before I join the call that Kevin mentioned for the groups to consider where we are given what the events were over the weekend. So I uh, thank you, Danette, for sharing this. Now, this should go out everybody Tuesday. Um, we're going to put the link in it in the in the chat right before we go. And there's a few things already that I would strengthen. As I mentioned, you can see the part. Um, okay, somebody edited this and changed it, so we're not going to read this one. Um, yeah, um, I don't know who put in two million Palestinians, but that wasn't in there before. Uh, there were some typos. Let me check real it's quick. It's okay, Danette. Uh, Danette, we're just going to have to send out a different link because okay. that, that, somebody changed that text, okay? So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to read it off of my Microsoft Word document. And uh, we have to do a better job of figuring out how to um, do this correctly. Um, uh, let me see here. Open up this. And now share screen. Um, share screen. That was... Two million displaced, Ellen, not not killed. I know, but it wasn't in the original form, so I don't know who added that. So okay. we're just we're just not making additions, okay? Um, and I cannot find how to do this on my thing. 
Can you just share the doc Word document that I sent to you, Danette? Yeah, hold, hold on. Let me bring it up real quick. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, I just don't know what other changes they may have made. I don't disagree with that. Clearly, that's the truth that nearly 2 million, but we just don't have space to make changes. The, one of the problems with this process is, first of all, everything that we send out, we do allow people to add their own flourishes in as they like. Uh, you don't have to just mimic every word that PDA puts into its letters that we share with our congressional liaisons before they go out. Um, and um, here, here's what we wrote. And again, as I said, the fourth point that, that uh, Kevin mentioned, I took the three points from the draft that are highlighted in, in, um, in bold uh, because, and they're in bold because they were the three points that the, the coalition that we're working with had highlighted in their draft letter, which I got from a link that Kevin sent me. So that's why the fourth one isn't in there, but here it is. As your constituent, I'm writing to express my deep concern over the brutal war in Gaza. We cannot allow the growing conflict between Israel and Iran to shift our attention away from the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Therefore, I support and progressive Democrats of Amer uh, progressives for democracy in America, and there's a typo there, uh, supports, that's our 501c4, by the way, Kevin, uh, these priorities of the national peace movement, establishing uh, a permanent ceasefire, um, conditional military aid to Israel, and restoring United Nations Relief and Works Agency funding. This war in Gaza is going into a six-month, and, and already the official death toll has surpassed 33,000, with mostly women and children killed. Nearly 2 million Palestinians have been displaced, many with destroyed homes that must be entirely rebuilt. Most urgently, the United Nations is desperately raising the alarm about an entirely man-made imminent famine that could kill tens, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands, if this war continues. While I and PDA support the right of all people to defend themselves and their societies, we do not hesitate in demanding that military aid be conditioned, even following the Iranian drone strikes. Simply put, the unfathomable suffering caused by Israel's seize of Gaza must end, regardless of other circumstances. Furthermore, the Israeli Prime Minister continues to call for escalating the siege into the Rafa refugee camp, where most of, of the Gaz where most of Gaza's population now resides in already desperate conditions. We must do everything in our power to halt a ground invasion of Rafa, which will almost certainly produce even greater degrees of death and misery. The United States of America must not count in such atrocities. While we are pleased to see a growing number of legislators call for a ceasefire, we were disappointed that no ceasefire resolution has come to a vote. We also have been thankful to some members of Congress that some members of Congress speak in favor of establishing conditions on Israeli military aid, as we can leverage this to pressure Israelis to agree to a ceasefire and release the flow of humanitarian aid. We are writing to ask for support for these efforts and to find out what concerns your boss has that have thus prevented them from doing so. And there's actually another phrase there that thanks people who have already supported them in the that, that had been in the, the Google document. Therefore, I am asking to meet with you and your staff members on this issue. Please let me know what, what, what at your, your earliest availability is, and we'd love the opportunity to discuss legislative opportunities and address any concerns the senator, congressman, congresswoman may have. And again, come to our meeting tomorrow at five, but take this, adjust it, correct the typos, if your congressperson has supported them, change that second to the last sentence to thanking them for supporting it and send it out on Tuesday. And I'd love for everybody on the call to do that. This is an absolute grade A double plus priority for Progressive Democrats of America and our 501c4. And um, look, um, we live in a democratic polity. We have a very perverted democracy, but in a democracy, we're accountable for the actions our government is taking What's been transpiring in Gaza is nothing that any of us here can countenance. We have to speak out against it and call for peace. So I encourage everybody to send this to their congressperson on Tuesday and to join our call if you can tomorrow at 8 o'clock. And Danette, again, if you can put that link in. Uh, Kevin, your thoughts on what we had there. And you saw the parts that were different from your letter because they were about Iran and the drone strikes and any reflections on those in particular. Well, I like that. And I, I just put it in the chat that I think the, the first paragraph is a very good introduction, given the uh, given what happened over the weekend. And uh, we've got a, a resources document that's got links to a number of things that we've been working on. And the policy sheet or the leave behind sheet to send to uh, members of Congress or that you give to them when you meet with them in person 
we're going to have to edit that a little bit anyway yeah. uh, overnight to, be, be, to reflect these these uh, developments. However, again, the core four demands are still you know every bit as righteous as they were on Friday. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, Mike Fox, if you can unmute for a second, everybody who signed up to the Zoom, uh, we have their emails pretty handy. So I can send a Microsoft Word copy to everybody that way tonight. Right, Mike? That's not an easy answer. Okay. Uh, okay. Ellen, it's gonna, I have corrected the link. So the link is, is correct. The Google Doc. And everyone should have that. Okay, so once again, let's good. Let's let's go to that in the chat. And if you could throw that in, um, the net. Okay, on this document again, all you have to do. No, it has two million Palestinians in it. We got to take that out. That was in the original document, Alan. No, I wrote the original document. It was not. Okay. Okay, tell me when it's correct from the Word document. What, what do you want me to put in there? Nearly what? No, 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 no. Nearly was never in there. Sorry, everybody, about this. Look, leave it, Danette. Well, let's go to Mimi Kennedy right now. And um, I, here, Danette, I sent you in, in a, I will send it again. I'm forwarding to you what you need to put back into the, um, into the, into the uh, Google Doc, okay? And um, and then we'll send that out. We'll let everybody know how to download that again, okay? I just sent it to you. Okay, Mimi Kennedy, thank you for your patience. What a weekend it's been. You came up with this brilliant idea that we exchanged a lot of conversation about before everything transpired, but I don't think anything changes around what your proposal is. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you for your patience. And if you want to just describe what we were talking about as a pragmatic way to get more support in Congress for holding back military aid to Israel. Welcome, Mimi. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Yes, events are moving so fast that what I thought would be a more timely intervention uh, may not be so at the time. People have already mentioned about how uh, we are already breaking so many laws of our own country and international law to which our country is signatory in various treaties that uh, a lot of this will fall on deaf ears. But my idea comes from something I discovered when Marcy Winograd, a PDA stalwart, um, ran for Congress uh, the second time. She had discovered that both Janice Hahn and Deborah Bowen, who had been my candidate, had signed a letter that they had been asked to sign, which pledged them to never deny aid to Israel for its self-defense. So there they were pledged to this as they ran their campaigns. Janice Hahn won and became a friend of PDA through Tim Carpenter's efforts at the time. However, it got me thinking that there are probably a lot of legislators who have signed such a pledge. I just Googled it. You can't find like pledge, never to stop military aid for Israel. Nothing comes up. But I suspect that either explicitly, formally, or implicitly, there are a lot of legislators who, besides their funding from APAC, uh, will always pass aid to Israel because they've somehow pledged it as, again, implicitly or explicitly. So I thought, why can't, in order for America's self-defense, here we are saying Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, so does the United States have a right to defend itself from future problems because we've been violating international law. So we would establish an escrow account and people could go on voting for aid to Israel, military aid, whatever it is that comes up uh, according to their pledge, implicit or explicit, but it goes into an escrow account and it's only released once the United States of America is assured and it would probably have to be by the UN and you can imagine how the current Israeli government would respond to that. Nonetheless, when the UN uh, certifies that our ally, Israel, who is going to receive this aid, is not using it to violate international law, and therefore we are not accomplices in criminal violation of international law. That was my idea. Establish an escrow account and then go on having your funding votes come up for Israel. But we are protected from violating, from being brought before criminal court 
International Criminal Court, the UN, from, as violators of international law. This is our self-defense. That was my thought. And uh, somebody said, well, who would uh, hold this escrow account? I said, I don't know. It would be some federal government. You know, I don't, I wasn't sufficiently knowledgeable about that, but somebody's holding the funds that we pay our taxes to for Social Security, et cetera. So whoever holds funds, that's where the escrow account is. And no more money, not that he voted no more money for Israel until they follow these various restrictions because that's so hard to pass. But this is, here's aid to Israel, but it's in an account until we're safe as the United States from violating international law with you. Well, before I ask Kevin for a quick comment, um, I want to say that we've solved the problem with the document. It is posted now on our website. You just click on that and hit download and you have the proper version. So there it is. And thank you, Matt, for that. And that all was not the net's fault. The reason we got in that horrible problem is because our P40A, our 501C4's website is down right now, which is where they're usually posted. So I apologize for all the confusion, but it has been solved and it is in the chat. Kevin, your thoughts on this idea of not just conditioning the funding, but holding funding so that it can be passed, the politicians can have their show of support for Israel thus, and yet um, that the humanitarian crisis and the killing must stop at least um, before the funds are released. Your thoughts on that? I think it's very innovative, and I like the connection to international law, which you know, to be truthful, unfortunately, not a lot of politicians in Washington give a hoot about international law, but we certainly do. And we want to strengthen it and uphold it. Um, so I like that aspect of it. Of the various initiatives that I'm aware of right now underway in the House and Senate, and I, I mentioned the one that Delia Ramirez had signed on to, that's NSM 20, which is the most recent policy that the administration agreed to that says not just Israel, it's not Israel specific, any country receiving U.S. military assistance has to certify that it's abiding by international humanitarian law, which is impossible for Israel to do with straight face, but they will, they will do that. So again, it gets back to enforcing existing U.S. law. Um, of the five or six uh, uh, initiatives that I'm aware of, I haven't heard anyone mention this idea about escrow. However, they all do mention both U.S. law and international humanitarian law. Um, the challenge is, though, this $14 billion that is proposed, whether it's separate or part of the larger national security supplemental, is more um, political, really, than a military necessity for Israel. Israel gets $4 billion or so a year in, in military assistance from the United States. Now, right now, in the immediate aftermath of these attacks over the weekend, they may need to replenish their interceptor missile stocks or, or whatever that may be necessary from their point of view. Uh, but in terms of the 14 billion, you know, under Obama, who, you know, Obama took a lot of flack for being too tough on Israel. And yet he signed off on this basically 10 year agreement that Israel will get, I think it's 3.8 billion a year in military assistance uh, from our tax dollars. And of course, one of the great things to point out about this is why are we giving Israel military assistance when Israel has universal health care and the United States does not have universal health care? So, you know, there are a lot of different aspects of this. I think one of the things about Mimi's idea, any idea that gets any traction in destroying the, the sort of blank check, Israel's always right, Israel gets our money no matter what, Anything that gets any traction at all and gets some members of Congress to reconsider or to think up about how they should vote against or try to condition military support for Israel, especially as this ongoing genocide and famine is happening, is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But I haven't heard anyone specifically bring up some kind of escrow account. Um, back to you, Mimi. Yeah, well, as I say, it didn't... In terms of saving lives, as I said to you, Alan, it's so sad to just sit around, be angry, be sad, not know what to do. And I yeah. wanted something that could allow people to keep on 
voting for their pledged support, but that it wouldn't actually go to kill people in Gaza. Um, I can see because of what I've heard about other initiatives happening that this is already joining a cluster of initiatives that will be seen as anti-Israel and progressive. So I'm not sure that it would make its way through the noise, but I'm hoping it might. No, no, I think I think it could actually, yeah. right? Yeah. Correct me, but I think it's conditional, right? We're in a situation, Kevin, where if the House passes an appropriations bill, the entirety of it. Then we're sort of screwed because it goes to it goes right to Biden. Right. If, however, they decide that that's too tricky and they think the simple path is to pass a single now because of what happened this weekend, right? A bill just for Israeli funding, it can go to the Senate, and then our allies in the Senate can introduce your concept. And as Kevin said, put sand in the in the in the throw some sand into the in the gears, as it were, possibly. Yeah. Possibly. And, and also what's going on here, too, some of the the chicanery within the Republican Party about Mike Johnson, if he puts forward the whole if, if Johnson puts forward the whole national security supplemental, it will probably pass in the House. OK, but then he might have Marjorie Taylor Greene vote to vacate him as the you know speaker. And I could give two hoots about Republican Falderall and what in the world they're doing, and they can shoot each other in the feet all day long <laughs> if they want to. My interest, though, is if they pass something different in the next day or two, there could be the opportunity for some of our allies in the Senate to introduce any number of ways to try to throw sand in the gears and to at least uh, delay, if not condition, uh, military aid. Now, they'll be under enormous political pressure to just cave in. Like, how can you do this when Israel was just attacked, right? Uh, and there is some, uh, there was a really good article in the Daily Beast today by David Rothkopf, who he's making the, and this is just speculation, but he's making the point that Iran felt like they had to retaliate for the Israeli attack on their uh, embassy in Damascus. But they knew that Israel had the capability to shoot down these missiles. right. right. It was right. it was kind of an intentionally yeah, I, and they I, announced I, it in advance to the world. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't say intentionally wimpy attack because you know you're firing missiles at another country and you could kill a bunch of people, but that they sort of knew that Israel was going to be able to uh, you know stop it. And for their part, they've said they're done. They've said they don't want further escalation. And for Biden's part, and this is where you don't have to necessarily pat Biden on the back, but he told BB take the win. Don't retaliate. And if you do retaliate or escalate, you don't get U.S. support. And forget about I don't think anyone's in, a, in the mood to pat Biden on the back. But the better way to say this is the U.S. does not have any interest in supporting Israel uh, escalating in the region. And that's where making a really clear and simple point that U.S. interests are not simultaneously that U.S. interests are not in sync with Israel's interests all the time. And this is certainly one of them. Um, both in terms of Gaza, but also the possibility of a, of a wider regional war that could possibly draw U.S. troops into it. And the American people have no appetite for that. And of course, PDA knows that because PDA was formed in opposition to the Iraq war, right, way back when. Um, so we're on right. solid ground on all of those points. The problem is the political support for Israel in Washington. I mean, that's, and, and you know, trying to pick off members of the squad. We're talking about Summer Lee's race a little bit earlier. They're trying to beat her with APAC money. I mean, it's, they're very clear about that. And they're trying to threaten Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, et cetera. So, you know, it's important for us to just to know what those forces are and what we're up against. But I think making the point that it is not in U.S. interest to support any kind of Israel uh, escalation, and you can do that without patting Biden on the back. But what he said to BB makes a lot of sense, that don't, don't escalate and don't expect U.S. support if you do. Um, element, yeah. Uh, it, it, Kevin, what are the specific restrictions, and what is the um, formula for regulating, um, honoring of those restrictions or supervising it currently in some of these bills in Washington? Because again, as I say, the escrow account would require some sort of regulating body to say, yes, okay, you're now in compliance with international law and you are not um, endangering United States' future by making us accomplices. Um, how does that differ 
from what is uh, restricting aid to Israel bills that are are proliferating now? Well, so the at least three that I'm aware of, one is what I already mentioned, and that should that letter that Delia Ramirez signed on to should be publicly released in the House. And what's good about that is it's it's fairly current. This NSM 20, which is National Security Memorandum 20, it's not a law, but it's a statement of administration policy that Biden signed on to. And it was kind of a compromise. Chris Van Hollen, senator from Maryland, one of my senators, had a pretty good amendment to the to the National Security Supplemental, and then they didn't allow any amendments. So his compromise was, OK, and it's not Israel specific, but again, any country that receives U.S. military aid has to certify that it's complying with international law and is not restricting humanitarian aid. Bernie Sanders has raised Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act that goes back to 1961, I believe, that makes essentially the same point that uh, U.S., and this is existing U.S. law, any country is ineligible for U.S. military assistance if they are restricting humanitarian aid. And that's been ongoing by Israel. And Van Hollen and Merkley and others have testified to that, seeing the trucks that are lined up at the border that Israel doesn't let through. And if you need just one example, the most recent example was the murder of the World Central Kitchen workers. So that's another one. The third one is, uh, and there are, there are more, but these are the three that I think are the most um, current. The third one, well, they could try to do a war powers resolution they could try to do a JRD joint resolution of disapproval to stop a particular arms sale, arms transfer. Uh, they could do, uh, what's the other thing they could do? And there's a third one that I'm forgetting, but there already are a number that are in process. And again, they're all citing, they, they're not breaking any new ground in terms of, of a new, new U.S. law. They're citing existing U.S. law and international humanitarian law. But again, okay. it's all about politics, not policy or law, right? If if you you can cite any law you want to till you're blue in the face, but if members of Congress or the administration thinks, well, we have to support Israel because of APAC or the pro-Israel lobby or not looking, you know, pro-Iran or something, uh, so it's you know we have to make the case to uphold U.S. law. In MS twenty, you said Chris Van Hollen's amendment said that uh, any country has to certify. That's a self certification mechanism, and that. In the Israel has to certify, but we could say the United States government, in theory, could say no, you're lying, which they are. So but Israel asking, will. Yeah, it, Israel we're will. asking the same legislators to, to challenge Israel in ways that they have. Exactly, it, it's a political problem, no matter what. The idea about the escrow might be: does that give either political cover or get yeah. more uh, support than the other approaches? And I'm, I'm, I think it's a novel idea. And I also like how you link it to international law, but the other ones do too. Uh, I don't have anything in front of me about what the third effort is, but these are all ongoing by you know serious members of Congress, both in the House and Senate. I don't expect we're going to win on any of this anytime soon, right? Um, the political pressure on Biden and the possible threat to his reelection is probably the most important thing uh, well, to get him to, to you know, hold uh, can... Israel's feet to the fire for a ceasefire. Oh, yeah. So, well, um, just to ask you then, and then maybe Mimi can have one final thought and question before we let Kevin go and prep for his next meeting. Um, I mean, I. I I mean, I think even the political calculus the Biden administration is making, what is it? It's that the money of APAC and associated forces is so overwhelming that the fact that young progressives, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans um, are going to abandon and other core constituents are going to weaken their support for Biden, which when he only won the last election by 40,000 votes in three states, or we still have President Trump, in spite of the seven million person, right, uh, popular vote difference, right? That's his calculus. That that force is greater than the impact of those constituents. That seems to me ridiculously wrongheaded. Is that your sense of why they're doing what they're doing, or going so slow and coming around to something halfway decent around this, Kevin? If I were to be cynical, because I don't, I'm not in Joe Biden's head, but if I were to be cynical, mm -hmm. what they think will save their hash is choice right. and, and revulsion with Trump. 
Right. And, and when it comes down to it, um, it's not that they don't care about how many people die in Gaza, but it's it's the political pressure that we've been putting on, and particularly the voting uncommitted, right. voting no right. preference, et cetera. That certainly got their attention. And Biden is now at least saying the right things about a ceasefire. Is he pressuring Israel hard enough? I don't know. Is he using the strongest lever, which is to cut off military aid? No, he's not, because he actually just proposed a new weapon sale to Israel uh, a week ago. So he isn't using the strongest lever that we have. And even the former right. Israel, former Israeli generals admit this. Without U.S. weapons, they can't carry this. Out. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, our, our work is never easy, but it, it's maybe harder than usual around this issue. Uh, and again, APAC does not re represent Jewish voters in this country at oh, all. Yeah. Right. Um, so we are having an impact, but not fast enough and not complete enough. Um, but Biden and his campaign, they they have to understand, you know, all, all it takes is them for to lose Michigan or Wisconsin because of their support for Israel's slaughter in Gaza. And Trump's the next president. And they understand that. Right. And uh, there obviously are forces there inside APAC, inside the Israeli government that want another second Trump presidency. Mimi oh, Kennedy. Oh, Netanyahu does. Netanyahu wants not only another Trump presidency, but he wants to stay out of jail. You know, he. <laughs> he, he goes to prison, you know, and his support in Israel is like in the single digits at this point. Mimi, a final thought for Kevin? Yeah, wow, thanks, Kevin. Well, from everything that you've said, I understand um, that the forces arrayed around our government are um, dangerous, wanting Trump, wanting somebody who will stay out of jail, wanting someone who could be a dictator. I think uh, that a lot of what Biden uh, is doing and a lot of what Democrats are doing is also um, to not to be fair to them, but to read into their minds and their histories is based on a history that they remember. And Israel, like our democracy, is definitely vulnerable in the Middle East. However, it has taken, in my view, the exact wrong way to defend itself by being a horrible neighbor and by being murderous. Uh, but I still think that that's what these Biden, what the Democrats think. They're, they're vulnerable in the Middle East and we pledge to always support Israel as our ally. Okay, that's why this escrow account exists because, or would exist. You can watch the mile money pile up in it and go, here's your hundred billion dollars. Israel, we know you need it. We know you're vulnerable. You know, we support you, but you're not getting it until you start being a good neighbor and according to international law. And that's both for our self-defense, which mutual recognition, right? We've recognized yours. You've gone over the line, now recognize ours. Here's the money for your vulnerable country. Now be a good neighbor in the Middle East. And, you know, maybe this is rosy posy and nobody believes it's possible, but I do. And I think the escrow account is a mechanism that could show the way forward. That's that's my... I, again, I think it's innovative and it might get more support, but you still have the same political problem. I know. Regardless of what, you, what existing U.S. law, international human law, appealing to morality, don't starve children, et cetera. We still have the same political problem in overcoming APAC, the pro-Israel, so-called pro-Israel lobby. I would call it the pro-apartheid lobby because that's what they want. They have no solution for the future. They reject any kind of Palestinian state. They want apartheid forever. And it's so unsustainable. And that's not in Israel's interest. It's, it's not in Israel's security interest. They can't have apartheid forever. But they think they can now. They think they, I mean, you know, look how unpopular Bibi is. But anyway, so whether the escrow is something that, that I think could maybe attract more support, you still have the same political problem, whatever it is. It, it, trying to enforce this part of U.S. law or that part of U.S. law, it's the same political problem to overcome the so-called pro-Israel lobby's influence. And the last, look, brilliant, you know, Mimi, Mimi popped this into my inbox or my text thread sometime late last week. And I'm like, whoa, that's some creative thinking and brilliance Very to try much. to get a good result. And, and we were closer to with the space where it could have played in a very powerful way, unfortunately, with the weekend's results. But we do know we have to watch to see if the full appropriations is passed because there's a little bit of an opening to really raise that if that's not the case in the Senate. Um, so that'll be in the next few days, as early as possibly tomorrow. Uh, 
Mimi, I will call you this afternoon later. I've got to run off to meetings. Kevin Martin, it is incredible to have you here. It is great. And um, we will be inviting you back, I'm sure. So, um, and I hope the partnership with Peace Action and PDA is lasts as long as uh, I'm at PDA and as long as I'm alive and as long as we need organizations like PDA and Peace Action, which is probably forever. So thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. Thank you, Alan. My pleasure. And thanks to all of you for your terrific activism. Thank you so much. And um, I'm five minutes late to a call to the uncommitted New Mexico people. But I can't leave yet because Danette has done some yeoman's work in cor correcting some typos. And as long as it doesn't get changed by somebody out there toying with us, right, Danette? The it best is way only viewable. You have to copy and paste it into Word. You can. And what is that? And what is that link? Is it is it there now? Can you throw I'm that gonna, in right I'm now? I'm going to put it in in about three, two, one second. There it is. So this is the best version now. It's if all you, corrected. If, typos are corrected. If you find anything, let me know. And sorry for the confusion. This is because of a technical problem on our server with our 501c4 account. All of this confusion. But, you know, I think we've made clear that people out there can adjust this to their own liking. Um, you know, as long as the clear central thematic is part of it, you can put it on P40A letterhead. That's the Progressives for Democracy in America. And um, thank you, Danette, um, for... Uh, sort of surfing the waves of chaos that our problem with our server and that I brought to this meeting. Well, I'm in California, so surfing is appropriate. That's the way to go. <laughs> now, um, I want to call on Neil and Alex before I leave, but I just, I'm going to close down and go to family time before I do that. And I can't leave without saying as great as it was with Kevin and as brilliant a contribution as Mimi is making. And just all of us out there, by the way, take a lead from what Mimi has done this past week. Don't ever think um, you know, that, that you know, you're not the executive director of PDA, and therefore you can't really put forward ideas that are good ideas. Every one of us out there, put forward your ideas, you know, troubleshoot them with your friends, um, troubleshoot them on our listservs. Um, we, we look, our organization is doing well, we're growing in profile. I had a really good conversation with a re real. American political player earlier today. And he said, from looking at from New York City through the lens of Washington, D.C., but out there in the eastern seaboard, they see PDA rising. Okay? We can influence things, folks. So big props to Mimi for proposing that. Thanks to Kevin. But boy, would I be remiss if not referring back to the first hour. And isn't Delia Ramirez amazing? I mean, just... We need public servants like that, folks. And that's that's all of us, any of us, encourage people to understand their civics and um, participate. So let's go to family time. Then we'll go to Neil and Alex. Um, Mike Fox, let's go to family time. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back next week with an incredible show featuring the youth of America who have challenged the government for not stepping up and addressing climate change. It's going to be um, a, P a town hall that will be led in large part by Hartzell and William from YPDA, but with the young people, hopefully from Montana, who brought that successful lawsuit. We know some people from Hawaii will be joining us. We believe Oregon as well. And in D.C., don't forget, um, it's Earth Day week, a week from Monday's Earth Day. Sunday will be the day before. So this upcoming weekend, I know in D.C., is sort of Earth Day weekend. By the way, on Fridays across the country, Fridays for the Future is going to get revived again. The Greta Sunberry, you know, walk out of school thing. I know that my daughter's school has something like that going on this Friday. Encourage your the young people in your life who are still in high school to do the same, middle school, high school, et cetera to participate in the Fridays for Future on April 19th, this Friday, because this is Earth Day weekend coming up. So thank you 